his finger, how he went to his wives, how he kissed his wives, how he dressed, how he combed his hair. Now all of a sudden we can't find one hadith, not talking about fadail or dhikr. Listen that carefully, not asking about virtues of dhikr, that's what trying to trap us with. We don't want fadail, we want kaifiyah. We want to know this is what the Prophet Muhammad told us to do. Finish. Finish. إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا من سيئات أعمالنا من يحده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الحج حج محمد صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي After praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and sending immense greetings and salutations upon the final Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam who was sent primarily to give the message of Tawheed the belief in the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and likewise to purify the people to take them out of the realms of darknesses and bring them to the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala يُخْرِجُهُمْ مِنَ الظُّلُمَاتِ إِلَى النُّورِ takes him out of darknesses to the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And thus we find that Islam, vahiran wa batinan, the external factors of Islam, likewise the internal factors of Islam, have all been discussed and taught and highlighted by the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As the Quran mentions, وَأَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكَ الذِّكَرْ لِتُبَيِّنَ لِلنَّاسِ مَا نُزِّلَ إِلَيْهِمْ وَلَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ We've sent down the dhikr upon you that you may explain it to mankind that which has been sent down and they may reflect and ponder over that. So we want to discuss the external factors of Islam and likewise the internal factors because certain individuals or certain fractions of Muslims have begun to highlight or to teach people that that which is external is different from that which is the internal. And we all know that as common Muslims, that externally we adorn ourselves and try to be in emulation and imitation of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As the Quran mentions in Surah Al-Ahzab, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْرَةٌ حَسَنًا لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهُ وَالْيَوْمَ الْآخِرُ وَذَكَرَ اللَّهُ كَثِيرًا Indeed, for you to emulate and to copy the Prophet Muhammad is a fine example for us Muslims, whoever believes in Allah and the last day. Indeed, your character is so sublime, so manifest, so great, the character of the Prophet Muhammad So the external factors that we adorn ourselves with, whether it be the garments and the dress that we find the Quran mentions, Ya Bani Adam, khudu zinatakum inda kulli masjid. O children of Adam, when you come to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, come to the masjid, khudu zinatakum. Take your best clothing, your best attire, your best dress sense. Like what he finds us sort in Muddathir, wa thiyabaka fatahir. Purify your clothing, your garments. That is part of Islam to externally purify ourselves. An nivafa. Nisful Iman, cleanliness, it's half of Iman, it's part of Iman. And likewise, we find the internal factors as well. That day whereby the wealth and the children will not benefit the individual except for the individual who comes with a pure heart. There are both factors that Islam discusses the internal and the external. That is Vahir and Bakhtin. And as Muslims, we know that there will always be any even enemies, external enemies towards Islam. As the Quran mentions, you find always individuals or groups or fractions 
who will have an animosity and hatred towards Islam and towards the Muslims. And likewise, you find the opposite factor, they will also be enemies from within. Whether that enemy becomes oneself, one's nafs, one's desires, one's lust, or it becomes to be people from within Islam, unfortunately, who try to break the message of Islam. It's something which has been documented right from the beginning of the time of the Prophet Muhammad, so there will be individuals, especially in the beginning of the period of the Medinan period. Because in Mecca, in the Meccan period, in those first 13 years, we find there was only Iman and Kufa. There was either Iman or there was disbelief. There was no third fraction, no third group. It was only when the Prophet Muhammad traveled to Medina, the final 10 years, that we find a third group became apparent. That third group is a munafiqoon, the hypocrites, never existed before, who began to deceive individuals. Thus you find that the role of the hypocrite is externally to take the role of a Muslim. And hypocrites at that stage took everything to apparently display themselves as Muslims, but internally trying to work within to destroy Islam, to dismantle Islam, to create doubts, ill feelings, rancor, breaking away from the congregation and breaking away from the teachings of Islam. So this shouldn't surprise us that the discussion that we have today, whereby some of these individuals clearly show by their own actions, their own statements, that there is no excuse that we can give them that these are troublesome individuals who will try to dismantle the Sharia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from within. And thus you'll find that they always quote this concept of ilmul bahir, the apparent knowledge, wa ilmul batin the hidden knowledge. And for them, we know that, for us, we know as Ahl Sunnah, that the knowledge that the Ahl Sunnah take is based upon nusus, is based upon texts, based upon evidences from the Quran and the Sunnah. <coughs> that is the foundation of Ahl Sunnah. That's what it means. People who follow Sunnah, follow the text. As for these individuals we find, they classify themselves as people who take ilmul batin, who take the hidden knowledge, the hidden sciences. <coughs> So we base our sciences upon authenticity, that's what Islam is based upon. But they try to highlight that the Islam that they are trying to follow is based upon these hidden factors. So that's when we narrate hadith to them, they turn around and they say that their findings are based upon adhuq, upon taste, al kash, al ilham, discoveries, unveiling, inclinations that come down upon them is what these people claim, the knowledge that is given to them. And that's when we narrate a hadith, this is what they say about the Quranic sciences or the sciences of prophetic tradition of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If they hear anyone narrating hadith, they say this person is miskeen, it's a poor individual. They've taken their hadith, the prophetic tradition from a dead person, from another dead person, from another dead person. وَأَخَذْنَا عِلْمَنَا عَنِ الْحَيِّ الَّذِي لَا يَمُودِ حَدَّثَنِي قَلْبِي عَنْ رَبِّي As for us, we've taken our knowledge from the ever-living, the eternal one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They say that my heart, يَنِي حَدَّثَنِي قَلْبِي عَنْ رَبِّي My heart spoke to me from my Lord. So this is the foundation. What is the foundation? Before we move into the other practices that we find, whether it be the dress sense, the food, the vigor, whatever they do, Go back and look at the foundation, the principles of what their belief is based upon. What is the essence of their belief? And then you can begin to understand the rest of the views that begin to stem. Because if the foundation is corrupt, then what comes out of the foundation will be nothing but corrupt. When the foundation is strong, is solid, as the Quran mentions, of the good belief, أَسْلُوهَا ثَابِتٌ وَفَرْعُوهَا فِي السَّمَاءِ a good tree has good roots and every so often it gives out the beautiful fruits. Its branches go up into the heavens. As for that tree, which is corrupt, has no foundation, has no foundation at all, quickly taken out of the ground. So the fruits that they give out are bitter fruits based upon their incorrect belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we're not here to reject a zuhud, <coughs> abstinence, tazkiyah, staying away from this dunya, not to get too involved inside the dunya. That's not our intent. We want to go and see that what is this journey, 
what they claim to be a tasawwuf. Tasawwuf never really existed as a word before. But just as we find it began to become prominent at the later stage. But how do ulama describe what is tasawwuf? What is Sufism that we find which, is, which we are surrounded about? The most conventional view that we find that ulama mentioned is that the word originates from Suf. Suf meaning bull. Based upon that some individuals, Ibn Taymiyyah mentions, mentioned from Muhammad ibn Sirin, that the people of Isa alayhi salam would wear woolen garments. Because there was Zuhab, people who were abstaining from the world, etc. So some individuals began to copy them, emulate them, began to emulate them and began to wear such woolen garments as well. Secondly, we find the root word of Sufism, or the Sufi is the Arab word, Safa. Safa meaning purity. That's you find Sufism becomes purity of the heart and soul. The third view that mentions that Sufism is based upon Ashabu Sufa or Ahlu Sufa, the companions of the veranda, the people used to live outside the masjid of the Prophet Muhammad those 300 or so in number. So this goes back to those individuals, poor individuals, destitute individuals, whatever charity would come, they would eat from it and live a simple life outside the masjid of the Prophet Muhammad Al-Bayruni goes to the view that this word, the tasawwuf, is linked to the Greek word Sophia. Sophia means wisdom. So these are individuals who are full of wisdom. Thus we can see that they, the influence of Greek in the concept that begin to develop inside these individuals. So people may think, well maybe the beginning has a good intent. And that's why many ulama have mentioned that its outward you know, manifestation appears to be piety but its inward reality forsakes the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So externally it seems pious. But you find that internally it begins to corrupt away from the teachings. The most absolute pure, if the word is correct, Sufi that there was, the Sufi master was none other than the Prophet Muhammad And he advised those individuals who began to become harsh upon themselves. There's three individuals we find of deciding to pray all night, of deciding to fast every single day, and deciding to stay away from the men. What did he advise them? He said, indeed, when he heard about this, indeed, I pray and I break my prayer and I rest. Indeed, I fast and I break my fast. Indeed, I marry and I have a relationship with women. فَمَنْ رَضِبَ عَنْ سُنَّتِي فَلَيْسَ مِنِّي Whoever turns away from my sunnah has got nothing to do with me. No one can ever claim to be a better zahid, a better absolute individual than the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that's you find the whole concept of what you find the coming of uh, the khawarij that we find, the essence of it, we go and read the whole tarikh was a man, Dhul Khawaisara, who said to the Prophet Muhammad Yani, be just. And that angered the Prophet Muhammad He said, if I don't be just, who will be just? That he is the most God-fearing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that this led this extreme view, and so you read all of the, the traits of the Khawarij that you find, that their foreheads with signs of, 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 of prostration, of devotion, reading the Quran, etc. So these are not symbols in Islam. And a person is, sees that a person is a zahid, is abstinent from the dunya, or a person doesn't eat much, or lives away from everyone, is aloof, or lives a simple life. <coughs> That's not the criteria to judge by. The criteria of the Muslim is based upon the text, based upon the evidences of the Quran and the Sunnah. And that's what we find, especially in the land of Basra, that you find many zuhad that came before, like Imam Hassan al Basri, uh, as we find, is well known. Other other great ulama, ulama collected that existed there. Many of the companions were known to live an abstinent life to stay from this dunya. This doesn't become a hujjah, an evidence that this is a, a tariqah or a path which is allowed. Because especially that we find it wasn't until at a later time in the Middle East in the 8th century, then further on you find in the 10th century that you find the Sufi literature and manuals begin to become prominent. And thus you find that various principles are developed, whether it be inside the Al-Aqidah, or about the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, or that which is classified as Wahdatul Adyan, the coming together of all, all of the religions, or Al Awliya Wal Karamat, or the saints and the miracles that are given to them. As for Aqidah, that we find that you find the infusion you know, of, of Greek philosophies, we uh, mentioned Greek logic, Hinduism, Buddhism, that we find, and likewise Christianity, because they thought that Christianity is a life, the monks living a life of abstinence. As you find that the monks, even today, the religion of Catholicism, for them, 
many actions are haram. It's haram. That's why it leads to absurdities. It leads to corruption. It leads to faith. You can all understand what I'm referring to. If a man stays from that life saying that Islam isn't like that. Islam doesn't go to one extreme or to the other extreme. Islam follows the middle path. That this is a path that a Muslim needs to follow to become successful. That's the Quran mentions. That this Rahbaniya, ibtada'uha, this Rahbaniya, this monasticism of staying aloof from society, ibtada'uha, that Christians invented this. This is an innovation. And that some Muslims felt that the only way that we can come to that high level of spirituality and devotion is to follow the same path of creating some form of spirituality, of monasticism, staying away from the people, living not in the monastery here, but living in the masjid or living in a special environment or living in the cave, whatever it may be, and we can become pure and spiritual in the individuals. And then you find from this what begins to take place, this infusion of philosophy and the deviant sects, whether it be the Karamiya and Bataniya, you read the whole history of these groups, you find all these groups <coughs> begin to filter into the Sufi belief. You find amongst their belief what is known as Wahdatul Wujud. Wahdatul Wujud is basically pantheth, pantheism, whereby you find that deity dwells in human souls or that the deity is incarnate in humanity, that everything is just a reflection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You become infused with the Creator. You find anna kulla mawjood hu Allah. Everything living in front of you is part of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's just taken from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Halul, yani that Allahi aw sifatihi fil makhluqeen. That a part of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes into the actual creation. This is part of their, their creed, part of their aqa'id. You come to certain spiritual devotions that you will eventually come one with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ibn Arabi, who's classified as Shaykh al Akbar. The greatest Shaykh for them is Ibn Arabi, who lived from the year 560 to the year 638 of the Islamic calendar. Also known as Al Arif Billah. Also known as Al Qutb al Akbar, the great pole, the great pivot. The most knowledgeable of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and also known as Al Ikbriya Al Ahmad, the red sulfur. Likewise, the sweet musk, and other titles are given to him. Such beautiful names you find for this individual. But what, are, what was his creed? What are the words that he uttered? Rather, you find such foolish beliefs. Amongst his statements, he writes lines of poetry: "A Rabbu Haq, wal Abdu Haq, Yalayta Shari, Man Al Mukallaf." The Lord is true. The servant is true. May my hairs stand up on end. I don't know who is the one that is responsible. In Qul to Abd, if I said the servant, Fada Karam. If I said the servant is responsible, then the servant is actually the Lord. Or قُلْ تُرَبْ If I said the Lord, أَنَّ يُكَلَّفْ So how can the Lord be commanded? Meaning that you are Lord yourself. How can you command the Lord to do something? This is document his own works. If you look at فُتُحَاتِ الْمَكِيَةِ Any the, the Meccan revelations and فُصُوص الْحِكَمْ Bezels of wisdom. It's clearly documenting what his belief is. And that doesn't sound so strange enough. Then maybe وَأَنَّ مَنْ عَبَدُ الْعِجَلْ مَا عَبَدُ إِلَّا اللَّهِ Those people who worship the calf, the cow in the story of Musa alayhi salam that we find, they were not worshipping the cow, they, they weren't worshipping the golden cow that was made out of gold, they were actually worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when Harun rebuked them, Harun is being rebuked in the Quran because he prevented them, didn't stop them, he was stopping them from worshipping the cow, he was, should have allowed them to carry on worshipping the cow, that's why he's being rebuked, is their belief. Look how they make ta'wil of the Quran, Harun is rebuking them. And saying that he's rebuking them in the wrong manner. He should have allowed them to carry on. That's why he's being told off in the Quran, because he did not allow the people to carry on worshipping the cow. Because according to his belief, the cow is symbolizing nothing but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a symbol of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is within this cow. Likewise, you find Anna Fir'aun A'lam Billahi min Musa. Fir'aun is more knowledgeable yani, than Musa. That's what he claims. وَأَنَا رَبُّكُمُ الْأَعْلَى So when Fir'aun made this statement, أَنَا رَبُّكُمُ الْأَعْلَى All of us Ahl sunnah know that this was clear kufr, clear rejection of belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He writes Ibn Arabi, this proves, he's trying to highlight that he has become one with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can't understand these words. He is a great believer. On top of that you find, إِنَّ Iblis who a mu'min. Iblis is a believer as far as Ibn Arabi is concerned. Likewise, you find Qurratu Aynin Li Walak when you find that Musa is taken by, by, by Fir'aun and Asya says that he will be the coolness of the eyes for me and for you. 
So look at the tafsir that's made by Ibn Arabi. He says that the coolness of the eye, فَكَانَ قُرَةَ عَيْنِ فِرْعُونَ بِالْإِيمَانِ الَّذِي أَعْطَى اللَّهُ عِنْدَ الْغَرَقِ The coolness of his eyes will be that when he drowns, he's drowning in a state of Iman. These are words which have been documented quite clearly that none of these individuals can denounce and say these words don't exist and don't go back to Ibn Arabi. Like when you read other works of the tafsir that you find that which they classify as tafsir bin ishara, which ulama have discussed. But there are principles based upon tafsir bin ishara, as Ibn Qayyim al Jawziya highlights, that the meaning is not stretched away, it's not taken away from the essence of the Quran, and it's not bringing in something that doesn't exist. So you find that throughout their works they tend to make these ta'wilat, walakin la tafqahuna, yani tasbihahum. As the Quran mentioned, you cannot understand their praise. So they try to highlight, you can't understand the praises of these individuals. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about the plants, the trees, the animals, whatever it may be. The creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all the praises of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We can't understand how they praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they try to highlight, you can't understand the way that these, these mystical individuals are praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, فَخْلَعْ فَخْلَعْنَ عَلَيْكَ Take off your two shoes. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to Musa alayhi salam when he came to the Mount Tawr. Remove your shoes. The commandment that was given to Musa alayhi salam. They make ta'wil that this means وَآخِرَتَ Get rid of this dunya and the hereafter. We get rid of the two shoes, yani fight your, your soul, your nafs, your heart, your desires, fight them. What relationship does it have taking of your two shoes and meaning to get rid of you know, this dunya and work towards yani, the akhirah? Likewise, you find when يَأْتُوكُمْ usara, They come to you in a state yani, of, of captives. Here they highlight that they come to you yani, غَرْقَ yani, uh, فِي الذُّنُوبِ They come to you in a state of sinfulness. How these people come. Likewise, other ayat of the Quran, Waljari bil Qurba, Waljari bil Junubi, the Waljari bil Qurba, the close neighbor means your heart. And you find the faraway neighbor means any your nafs. Likewise, and other any ta'wilat of the Quran, Falamma fasala talutu bil Junubi, Kala inna Allah mubtadikum bin nahr. You find when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala any made any talut came any with his army and said that we're going to test you with this river. And said to Yani, he said to Talut in his army, Yani, for man shall be minhu, for laysa minni, or man lam yak amhu, for in no minni. Whoever drinks from it is not going to be Yani from Yani, the right group, from the right party. But whoever takes a small amount, a small handful of water, illa man ikhtara fa ghurfatan bi yadi, fa shari bu minhu, illa qalila minhu. Whoever takes a small amount of water, then that is the right group. That is allowed for you to take. So it's quite clear what this example is giving. An army that's out, commanding has been given. Don't drink from the water, only drink a small amount of the water. They make tafsir in his eye of the Qur'an, the river is the world. That's what the whole of this world is, it's like the parable of a river. Whoever drinks excessively will fail. Whoever drinks too much water will fail, takes too much of this dunya will fail. And whoever abandons it totally cannot survive. So all, all of us obviously we need water to survive. But the one who takes the bare <coughs> minimum of what he needs is the one who will be successful. So this is the ta- we may sound good. What they're trying to make of these ayat inside the Qur'an, but the context is quite clear. Likewise, you find that the Qur'an begins with the basmala, with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, harf ba, and ends with, yani, with, yani, Malik al-Nas ilayhi nas min sharul waswas al-Khanas, al-Ladhi yuswisu fi suduri nas min al-Jinnati wal-Nas. Ends with what? With a scene. So, al-Amr begins with ba, with scene, bas. Bas, yakfi. Yani, the Qur'an, yakfi ka. The Qur'an contains everything that's inside there. What relationship? Whether the Quran begins with a half ba or ends with a half seen, what difference does it make? There's nothing when specifically mentioned from a hadith of the Prophet Muhammad that this is what the meaning that it that it entails. That's why Ibn Arabi in his famous tafsir, as we mentioned previously, tafsir al Batin, the hidden tafsir. This tafsir is full of so much kufr and shirk and corruption and incorrect belief that even Al Azhar University that you find normally has a, a lenient stance in allowing certain books to be published, etc banned, decreed, a, 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 a fatwa prohibiting the publication and the sale of this work. So this from an institute that's, that's living today, and Azhar Sharif has banned the publication and the spreading of the tasir al-Batin of Ibn Arabi. And we know Al-Azhar <coughs> Sharif is known at times a very liberal stance at times about certain books that may be allowed, but they've even concluded that this book is full of so much kufr, so much shirk, so much corruption, decided to ban any the printing and the publishing any of this book. Other tafsir uh, bil ishara, you find famous ulama, those you may want to go back and study them, you find tafsir al Quran, the Tustari died in the year 283, haqaiq al tafsir, 
He died in the year 412. Likewise, as Shayrazi died in the year 666 of the Islamic canon. These are famous books that they, they will go back and they will rely any, upon them. Likewise, you find that this form of tafsir, does it follow the methodology of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu That's the second stage. What is their belief regarding the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu What do they believe in that differs from the belief of the Sunnah? Yet they try to always taunt Ahl Sunnah, you classify him as only a bashar, as only a human being, as only a servant. We follow exactly what the Quran tells us. As the Quran mentioned, indeed, revelation is given to me. That indeed, revelation is sent down upon me that your Lord is one. And rather, I'm only a human being. That's what the Quran tells us. Likewise, the Quran tells us he's Al Abd. Furqana ala abdihi liyakuna li alamina nadira. Blessed be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who sent the Furqan, the criteria in the Quran, on his servant. Likewise, in the beginning of Surah Al Isra, Subhanahu wa ta'ala, Asra bi abdihi layla min al masjid al haram ila al masjid al aqsa. Blessed be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, glorified be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, took his servant. So these are the kalimat used by the Quran. So that doesn't mean we become derogatory towards the Prophet Muhammad. We're using the language of the Quran as for we all believe as Ahl Sunnah that there were great miraculous powers and skills given to the Prophet Muhammad that externally, yes, he was a human <coughs> being, but internally his iman, his yaqeen, his certainty, his devotion, his mu'jizat that were given to him. We believe in all of them. We don't reject any one of them. That's why Imam al-Bayhaqi wrote a whole book, Dala'il al-Nubuwa, printed some four volumes talking about all of the miracles of the Prophet Muhammad But they just want to taunt people saying, as soon as you say the word Bashar, they say, you are now trying to show disrespect towards the Prophet Muhammad So they have to play upon this, on people's emotion. These people don't really love the Prophet Muhammad Whereby the Prophet Muhammad highlighted towards the end of his life. Woe upon the Jews and the Christians. Do not extol me. Do not praise me as what these people have done to Isa ibn Maryam. Indeed, I am only the servant and messenger of Allah. That's what you should say. So these are amongst the final words of the Prophet Muhammad. Who are we to come along and say, no, we can now raise his rank to this. We can say he's still living. He's still eternal. He hears our supplication. We can make tawassul. We can go and intercede or ask, make, use this as an intermediary to get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And thus you find, لو لا لو لا ما خلقت If it wasn't for you, if it wasn't for you, we would have not created the heavens and the earth. It's the statements that they make. Like what you find, another statement that when Adam salam was inside the heavens, he looked at the Arsh of Rahman. He saw the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and there he saw the name Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa So he mentioned the name. Many times you find even many Messiah people read these ahadith after Salat al-Asr etc. They read these ahadith and Allah said that, how do you know this name? Straight away first you find this is kufr. How can Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say, how do you know this name? I saw this name written on the Arsh. And if it wasn't for Muhammad I would have not have created the heavens and the earth. Ulama of hadith mentioned, this isn't even a hadith, this is mawdu, it's a fabrication. It's a lie, it's made up. That's why you find hadith in Bukhari, man kadaba alayya muta'amidan falyatabawwa maqadu min al Whoever intentionally attributes a lie to me, let him take his seat in the hellfire. So these foolish individuals, you find this because shaitan, so Ibn Jawzi wrote a whole book, uh, Ibn Jawzi, Talbis Iblis, the deception of devil. For them, they twist everything. They say, لا نكذب عليه نكذب له We don't lie upon him, we lie for him. They openly say this, don't be deceived. Look what they do to the hadith. They admit the hadith is sahih inside Bukhari. Mutawatir, it's authentic. So the only way they didn't come out of the trap of the hadith, they say, we don't lie upon him, we're lying for the Prophet Muhammad What's the evidence inside the Quran as well? The Quran mentions, يَا يَا رَسُولُ بَلِّغْ مَا أُنزِلَ عَلَيْكَ مِنْ رَبِّكَ وَإِن لَمْ تَفْعَلْ فَمَا بَلَّغْتَ رِسَالَتَهُ A messenger convey to the people the message has been given to you. If you don't do it, you have not fulfilled the trust. Then the end of the ayah mentions, conceals their argument, seals them, and these people try to insert something. How does the ayah end? وَاللَّهُ يَعْصِمُكَ مِنَ النَّاسِ Allah will protect you from mankind. We don't need to protect the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We don't need to lie for him. We don't need to protect him. We don't need to champion his cause. The Quran says, Wallahu ya'simu kabinan nas. Allah will protect you from the whole of mankind. So who are we to come along and now to claim that I'm doing this for respect for the Prophet Muhammad I'm doing this to dignify him, to give him more honor, to give him more dignity. 
that's you find people al al Bawsari, al Bawsari at the moment written previously al Burda. You find his Burda. If you read through you read the Burda, nothing at Kufr. And then you find where عندك علم اللوح والقلم and you have the knowledge of the pen and the final day and the, the guided tablet. Who is he attributing these lines of poetry to? He's attributing these lines of poetry to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And that's this this corrupt belief. Regarding the Prophet Muhammad leads on to the third principle of Wahdatul Adyan, the coming together, the fusion of all religions. That's, that's where you find that this concept of humility, humbleness, don't say anything about anyone. Is that what the Prophet Muhammad came with? And the Quran tells us, وَلَقَدْ بَعَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةِ الرَّسُولَ أَنِعْبُ تُلَّهُ وَجْتَنِبُ الطَّاغُودِ Every message sent to tell people to worship only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, stay from ta'ud. It's a difference between using harsh and incorrect words and between using ud'u ila sabili rabbika bil hikmah wal maw'idha bil hasana wal jadilhum bil lati hiya ahsan. Call all to the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with fair preaching and wisdom and good conduct. Debate with these people with these good words. Like what the Quran mentions, Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat lil nas ta'amaruna bil ma'arufi wa tanhawna lil munkar. They're the best people. Raise up, you order the good, you forbid the evil. Likewise, you find in this, exactly the same surah that there should be a group of people who order the good and forbid the evil. Billah, and you believe in Allah. So, what does it mean, minuna Billah? That you stand there and allow people to, to highlight teachings of kufr and disbelief and say these are all paths. Every path of religion are all different paths that fuse together and come to the one path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is clear cut kufr. That is clear cut kufr. There's no concept of Abrahamic faiths. There's only one path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the deen in the Allah al Islam. The deen in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al Islam. So listen to the words of what these individuals they try to write, what they tend to highlight. You find Abu Sa'id al Khabraz, he died in year 277, he mentions, I follow the religion of love. That's why the Sufis are based upon the holy life just becomes love, al hub That's why even the al kalima al ishq never really existed any inside the Arabic language. <coughs> Ishq is something that they began to develop these, these kalimat that we find. I follow the religion of love wherever it takes me, so all religion is my religion and belief. Abdul Karim al Jili, fi kitabi al insan al kamil he writes, so I surrender myself to whatever my desires surrender me to. How can I dispute with the judgment of one beloved? Sometimes you may see me bowing in the mas masjid and other times I will be found worshipping in churches if in the judgment of Sharia I am a sinner, yet with regard to the knowledge of reality I am obedient. I am, to me belongs sovereignty, yet in both worlds. These are words that are documented according to their sources, what they themselves mention. Like we find this leads on to the concept of awliya wal karamat. Those are people who come close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and have those special blessings bestowed upon them. Once again, as Ahlul Sunnah, we do not denounce the blessings as the Quran mentions. أَلَا إِنَّ أَوْلِيَا اللَّهِ لَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَكَانُوا يَتَّقُونَ Who are the awliya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَكَانُوا يَتَّقُونَ Who believe and fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And taqwa in a nutshell is sticking to the halal, avoiding the haram. Living according to the sharia makes you a wali. That's how you become a wali. You don't break away from the sharia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and think you come close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. لَهُمُ الْبُشْرَ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ لَا تَبْدِيلَ لِكَلِمَاتِ اللَّهِ ذَلِكَ وَالْفَوْزُ الْعَظِيمِ That is, Bushra will be given to them inside this world. The glad tidings will be given to them inside this world. What are the glad tidings? Another similar verse inside the Qur'an. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا رَبُّنَ اللَّهِ ثُمَّ اسْتَقَامُوا تَتَنَزَّلُ عَلِيمُ الْمَلَائِكَ أَلَّا who are these ayat talking about? Those who say, Our Lord is Allah, ثم استقاموا. What does it mean, istiqama? Many ulama mention, istiqamu ala shari'ati Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ala tawheed, ala al-Qur'an, ala sunnah. That's what istiqama is. That they remain steadfast upon the shari'a, upon the Qur'an, upon the sunnah, ala al-fara'id, upon the obligatory action. Not to break away from them and to follow another, any methodology. Likewise, you find that the ahadith, they talk about the concept of coming close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala وَمَا تَقَرَّبَ عَبْدِ إِلَيَّ بِشَيْءٍ أَحَبُّوا إِلَيَّ مِمَّا افْتَرَقْتُ عَلَيْهِ The best way the believer comes close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's servant is via doing those obligatory actions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prescribed and then to do the supererogatory and do the extra actions and eventually 
that whatever the person looks at is only pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whatever the person touches is pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not as they try to say that once again, Allah comes incarnate within the individual. And he used to ask me, and I would respond to him, he seek my protection. If you seek my protection, I would protect you need this individual. Likewise, you find another hadith, Man aada li waliyin, faqad aadantu bil muharaba. Whoever harms one of my wali, one of my awliyas, I will declare war upon that individual. So we're all aware of these hadith. And once again, they try to use these hadith out of context to support their view. That look, the Quran is mentioning wali. The Quran hadith is mentioning, but not speaking any against them. And Ibn Taymiyyah mentioned, this, yani, this going against the norm yani, of these miracles and we know that in the time of the companions Umar had so many different yani, karamat that were given to him Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas had to one of the companions that mentioned in, in, in Bukhari mentioned in yani, Khubayb ibn Adi that the fruits yani, were given to him yani, in winter we'd find certain fruits in summer we find other fruits when they were out of season so this existed of these individuals who were the true awliya but every time he mentioned an excellent point he highlights that when people's iman begins to become weak, then they begin to look for these supernatural points. These supernatural points very rarely exist in the time of the companions, because their iman was firm. More and more people drift away from the companions, you find people want to see something supernatural. The most greatest supernatural, and if the word is correct, the miracle is what? Is the Quran. That's the miracle, the everlasting miracle that exists even today. So as you move away from the time of the companions, then these things begin to take place, that those people want to strengthen their iman, but he mentioned that يعني, This doesn't, uh, is present, doesn't harm the Muslim And if it's not being present, it doesn't increase the iman of the individual It doesn't affect the Muslim The Muslim isn't so affected by looking at something which is يعني, supernatural is what these people يعني, are trying to highlight And thus you find that they try to focus upon this concept of awliya You find al-qutub, al-awtad, al-arba, al-abdal, al-nujaba, al-nuqaba that you find and these various stations, and eventually you find clear words of kufr that you find the qutub, the, uh, the pivots, the poles around the earth that keep the earth into place. So when a person dies, or when he dies, follows these stages, eventually becomes a qutub, becomes a pole somewhere in the earth, and is protecting the earth. As you find, that's you find the of a sitta, you find that these six subtleties that you find you have to study to become into the realms of the world of the, world of the Sufi, the nafs, the qalb, the ruh, the sir, the khafi, wa akhfa, all these various you know, stations as well that you find you have to firstly follow you know, the path of you know, maqamat and halat, stages and ranks that you begin to develop, whether it be Sufi tariqas that you find following the certified sheikh, al-ahd wal bay'a, al-wird, certain form of adhkar, you have to perform al-khalwa, being going in a state of solitude with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, al-kashf, you know, that you find al-fana, annihilation, you're know, going one with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a manifest and hidden knowledge becoming apparent upon you, al-aqtab, and finally you become you know, a, a, a wali of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Al-ilm fi sudur la fi sudur Knowledge when we began with For us, you need the principle of knowledge are what? A text For them they say al-ilm fi sudur Knowledge is in the chest In your feelings and your perceptions that you get It's not based upon writing So obviously they want to make an incorrect understanding Obviously for Muslim, knowledge should be in one's heart and one's mind And likewise in the books and the scribes as well But they try to highlight the real knowledge That's what, saying. That's what, that's what they say about Ahl Sunnah you individuals have been taking external factors and been wasting your life, wasting your time. This is the real knowledge, the hidden knowledge that you have been missing your knee upon. Either one of them wrote in line of poetry, either talabuni bi ilmin waraqi. If they ask me for the knowledge you know, of, of, of the paper, meaning written knowledge, barrazdu alayhim bi ilmin kharaqi. Then I would expose them or come over them with the knowledge of these special in supernatural powers. Now what are the miracles? Let us look at the miracles that they've documented about the saints that they claim that they believe in. You find in you know, Abdul Wahab, you know, Sha'arani, famous Sufi you know, that you find in his book, you know, al Kubra or Tabaqatul Awliya, mentions you know, the miracles that are ascribed to these individuals. Then you can judge for yourself that, you know, who these individuals are, and what their beliefs are, and what they look up to. He mentions the miracles of Al-Ajmi, his gaze fell upon a dog. Other dogs took it as a leader. It became ill and it died. The dogs wept and visited its grave. Imagine yani, if yani, an Ajmi's gaze fell upon mankind, what would begin to happen then? <coughs> like you find attributed to Abdul Qadir Jilani, he walked past a dog and the dog got on the floor, put its paws up to the ground and said, Ya yeah, Abdul Qadir Jilani, 
make dua and I will say Amin. <laughs> like what Sha'rani mentions, his chief Ahmad al Badawi has control over the universe from his grave. And you find on one occasion, Ahmad al Badawi, his hand came out the grave and greeted him. It's been documented. This grave still exists in the Medina of Tanta inside Egypt that you, that you find. Still, people still gather there around the grave of Ahmad Yani al Badawi, who claimed to be Yani a Sayyid. So you find that there's all types of other filth you know, that cannot be mentioned in public, You're talking about uh, certain issues that the, the, the sheikhs that they would begin to practice and some of them giving the khutbah in a state of nudity in public. And obviously you can't understand why they're standing in a state of nudity. For, they, for you they seem to be in a state of nudity, doing uh, filthy actions with animals, etc. They begin to take place, but, it, but externally it seems you know, filth to you, but internally this is a state of unique. Know, of purification that you find. And thus you find the ulama mentioned, If you see a man flying in the sky, and he's walking upon the water, and his everyday practice goes against the sharia, know that this man is a devil. There is no way that a person can go against the text of the Quran and Sunnah and believe that this is a way of getting close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's been documented on numerous occasions that they will even say that that which you see visibly of what people may be dancing in front of us, kissing our feet, kissing our hands, whatever may be do, hatta you find you qabbil al-shaykh ala famihi, fi fami, hatta fi famihi, kissing the shaykh in his mouth. For you, you can't understand this, what this is, what this devotion, what this love is. You can't understand it. Any, even any individual would think that what type of actions are these? But this is any, the creed that, that you find, other st- blunders that you find, statements, Abu Yazid al Bustami, you find, Subhani ma a'adham al Sha'ni. Glorified I am, how great I am. Not saying Subhanallah wa bihamdi, Subhanallah Adim, Subhani ma a'adham al Sha'ni, how great I am. Like what you find, his student mentioned, seeing al Yazid is better than seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like what he mentioned, Khudna Bahran, yani we entered the ocean, waqaf al Anbiya bi sahilihi. And as for the Anbiya, they just stopped at the edge of the ocean. They stopped at the, at the, 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 the brink of the ocean. As for us, we've gone into the ocean. Bima'na, meaning that we are more knowledgeable than even the Anbiya. Like when you find Al-Farid, Talmid ibn Arabi, the student ibn Arabi that we find, Sultan Al-Ashiqin, you need the Sultan, the leader of the lovers, wrote a whole poem, Qasid to Ta'iyya. Wrote a whole po- poetry, lines, but they're good, that's what they're good for, writing lines of poetry, of Kufr, Yani uh, and shirk and, and then trying to justify it. That's you find the most famous poet that they have, Jalaluddin al Rumi, uh, that you find. Yani everything Yani is saying for me, as we mentioned before, the masjid, the church, or the temple. You find many of his lines of poetry that translate even today. People and you think that he's a great any <coughs> Sufi saint, etc. Even in, in you find Rumi cafes, etc. being opened up, but nothing but kufr and disbelief. And then it comes to a higher level of, of corruption, you come to Al Hallaj. Al Hussein. Ibn Mansur al Hallaj, who died in year 309 on the Islamic calendar, the year 922 of the Christian calendar. He mentioned, I am the one who loves, and the one who is loved is me. We are two spirits who dwell in a single body. So when you see me, you see him. So when you see him, you see us both. He mentioned, An al Haq, I am the truth. Ma fi jubbati illallah. In my clothing is nothing but Allah. Hatta in my turban is nothing but Allah. This field from this corruption, an al haq He made these words openly, that I am the truth. Challenge any Sufi to reject these words. They try to say you've made them up. It's documented in his own books. For Sus al Hikam, any bezels of wisdom, all these kufriyat, all these words have been documented by his own writing, then supported by his students. Then you find ta'alika, then you find any points that have been extracted from them, poetry is written by them, proving that these are the great saints and these are the great individuals. So thus you find. Going even further, you find this book Al Fusus Al Hikam. He mentions that I saw Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala in Sham, and Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala told me to take this book to the people. So Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala showed Himself Subhanahu Wa Taala to this individual, in Al Halaj, and told him to take this book, yani, and present it to the people. Inna anna anna iblis huwa kud inna iblisa kudwatuhu. Iblis is his example. That's what he writes in that book. My example, my role model is Iblis. Wa shaykhuhu Fir'aun. And my shaykh, my teacher, is Fir'aun. So what do you think should be done to the individual who
who follows such views. And in the year 309 of the, of the Islamic calendar, you find he was executed. That is what he's done to his individual. People still to this day, these individuals champion his cause. You, you don't understand what he meant by an al-haq. You don't understand. <coughs> when the Khalifa at that time understood what he meant, and that was the end of it. Rather, someone in the right that he was a Zoroastrian, a fire worshipper, full of kufr and shit, and he came in the disguise of Islam, as many of these individuals that they do, coming as we began in the disguise of Islam, to destroy Islam from within, and to attract the masses of crowds of people you need around them. Ibn al-Farid that we find, and all else prayed to me, and my prayer was not to anyone but me in every rakah. So everyone is praying to me, and whilst I'm even praying myself, I'm only praying any to my own self. And then he's also written a complete poem addressing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the feminine yani form. Likewise, find other comments, ilmu bihali yukhni an su'ali. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what my state is. There's no need for me to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No need. He knows. Finish. So this is what his life becomes for his individual. Not even <coughs> kufr and shirk. To dismantle the sharia and to stay away. That's what you find for them. A person who's eating leaves, who's living in the jungle. Fahuwa sufi, fahuwa zahid, fahuwa wali min, min awliya alayhi subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's a good person. He's close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I've noticed some of these individuals with my own eyes. I've seen many of them in this evil state. And they try to justify these are people who are close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Likewise, you can read the works of Kushayri and at Tijani in it as well. So maybe in it, they try to argue this does not represent us. That's what they say. They say these individuals are extreme views that existed just like you find any movement or whatever it may be. However, at the same time, they do not discredit them nor do they question their material. Because obviously they've been taught right down from the grassroots. Kun bayna yaday shaykh kal mayyit Be in front of shaykh like a dead person is when the body is being washed. These are yani, amongst any the principles. Stay in front of shaykh like a dead body. Like what you find, don't yani, uh, argue so you may be, you, need, you may split away. Like how you find, مَنْ قَالِ شَيْخِهِ لِمَا لَا يُفْلِحْ Whoever asks the shaykh why or how, that person will never ever be successful. مَنْ لَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُ شَيْخْ فَشَيْخُهُ الشَّيْطَانِ Whoever doesn't have a shaykh, then his shaykh is none other than a shaytan. Like how you find, أَدَابُ murid. Go and study the works of etiquettes of being a murid in front of the shaykh. لَا تُسَافِرْ Fair enough, don't travel without permission permission of the Shaykh وَلَا تَتَزَوِّجْ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِهِ Don't marry with his permission or maybe the Shaykh is one's father etc maybe that could be possible but then it goes a further level وَحَرَّمَ عَلَى الْمَرِيدِينَ السُّعَالِ and they made it haram for any murid any follower to ask them questions because if you ask questions then it may be exposed that your Shaykh is jahil your Shaykh is ignorant is a fool so that's why it's among the principles that never ever ask Never ever ask, because if you ask, then the sheikh will be any exposed about his any foolishness, and thus you find that any you find that amongst them you, they try to justify what they're doing. That's why many of the, the sheikhs that they mention that you know the, the dhikr that they have, the wir that they have, the one the sheikhs in, invited one of the Sufi sheikhs to come. You know, and you know how they love their food and their dinner. They invite them, say, look, come to my house and have have dinner. So he sent his two sons. <coughs> So he said to his two sons that every time the sheikh turns to the right, say Ahl al Musahlan al Sheikhi, he turns to the left, say Ahl al Musahlan al Sheikhi. So do that to the, to the sheikh, take care of him, greet him this manner. So they go to the sheikh's door, the Sufi sheikh, who would meet the sheikh, Ahl al Musahlan al Sheikhi, how you are, sheikh, welcome, come with us for dinner. So as they're walking, you know, every time he turns to the right, the, sh the son goes Ahl al Musahlan al Sheikhi, turns to the left, he goes Ahl al Musahlan al Sheikhi, all throughout the journey, throughout the journey. So obviously the Sufi Sheikh is getting frustrated. What's going on here? When he knocks on the door, the Sheikh opens the door, he says, Ahlan wa sahlan the Sheikh. And he goes, you as well? You as well, non-stop. On this journey, turn to the right, your son saying this, turn to the left, he's saying this, now open the door, you're saying it. He said, how about you all your life? Who? 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 You got frustrated with these words? All your life you've been doing this, and you've been disrespecting who? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala finish when did ever once the Prophet Muhammad say who they say it comes from la ilaha illallah from there it becomes Allah then it becomes who who then it becomes who then it becomes breathing through the nose that's when it becomes panting go into the dhikr and see how the lights are then dimmed and then you find what begins to take place bring one hadith don't bring us hadith the Prophet said make dhikr Sit down, count on your fingers, say La ilaha illallah, say La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah, say Subhanallah, say Allah. But no, 
give us the kaifia. Because if everything right down to the last dot, we've been told how the Prophet Muhammad urinated, how he walked, how he laughed, how he talked, how his beard moved in salah, how he moved his finger, how he went to his wives, how he kissed his wives, how he dressed, how he combed his hair. Now all of a sudden we can't find one hadith. Not talking about fadail or dhikr. Listen to that carefully. We're not asking about virtues of dhikr. That's what we're trying to trap us with. We don't want fadail. We want kaifiyah. We want to know this is what the Prophet Muhammad told us to do. Finish. End of story. You bring one hadith, then we join all your turuqat, whether it be Naqshbandiyya, Al-Tijaniyya, al jishtiyya al qadiriya whatever it may be, whatever, all these groups that you find that don't want to enter too much in it, and Shaitaniyya stuff. <laughs> Any, at the end of the day, we find refer, refer and compare it to what does the Quran tell us. For in Tanazatum Shayin, for Rudu in Allah, you are Rasul. In Kuntum to Minuna be Lahi, while Yom in Akhi, then the Kahiru Ahsan with that wheeler. For in Tanazatum Shayin. So if we differ amongst ourselves, as we began with, what is the criteria to judge? Is it a dog? Is it taste? Is it desires? Is it feelings? Is it perceptions? Is that the way that we judge? The Quran says, you differ amongst yourselves. فَرُدُّهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَالرَّسُولِ Refer it back to Allah and today we find the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refer it back to the messenger if you truly do believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the last day like all you find inside Surah Al-Imran the third chapter verse 31 قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهَ فَاتَّبِعُونِي That is a criteria you claim to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala follow me follow the Prophet Muhammad يُحْبِبْكُمُ اللَّهُ يَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ وَنُوبَكُمْ وَاللَّهُ غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ Allah will then love you. So you're searching for love, you're searching for devotion. You follow the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad, so you'll gain that love. And your sins will be pardoned and forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And likewise, if they try to hide behind famous individuals and say, look, well, Ibn Taymiyyah, he was a great Sufi. Ibn Qayyim al jawziya he wrote his book, Any Madari Jusalikin, Steps of the Travelers, talks so much about zuhud inside there. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Many of these ulama, famous ulama, they talked about tazkiyah because we mentioned tazkiyah is part of Ahl sunnah but even these individuals, Imam Ghazali, Al-Ihya, any ulum al that we find even many ulama made a strong critique of his works, and some of them even write that he then gave up in his studying of, of Islamic knowledge and went into the path of spirituality. That's when he said, I've discovered the real knowledge. Likewise, find any Imam al-Subhi, uh, like, like what Imam al nawi they tried to use these extractions and say, look, these were great ulama, great fuqaha, who at the same time had spirituality within them. These great fuqaha, these great ulama, if they even made a statement, even firstly, if it is true about them, if it is true and it is against the Quran and Sunnah, then what do we do? We reject it. Our faith is not based upon personalities. So if an alim comes along and that's his one slip, that's his slight mistake, because we know that most of these ulama, these great ulama, their service to Islam is great. A great service that they've done, the Torah, the heritage they've <coughs> behind, is immense. What they've left behind, their works of the Fasir of Ahadith. So even if it happened, let's say for argument, say it's true, that this one occasion, Ibn Taymiyyah mentioned something. Because we know that sometimes he talks about that when he was inside prison, what did he say? That my heart, my heart dances. Ah, look, there. He's a Sufi. <laughs> my heart dances, because if this is what the people of Jannah are facing, then this must be tranquility. So just extract that one part. Read the rest of his works, whereby he drills the concept of Sufism throughout his writing in his fatawa. Drills them all the way through, but this one word, my heart dances. So there you go, Ibn Taymiyyah was a great big Sufi. But then Ibn Taymiyyah, you could take something else. He's a great big Mufassir, great big Mujahid, he's a great big this. Everything can be extracted from his words. But what was the main subject? Whereby he destroyed the arguments of what they believed in. And that's right, he had a great deep life of spirituality. What can my enemies do to me? My, my paradise is right here inside my heart. So he lived a life of deep spirituality. Many of the ulama did. But they did not try to waver away from the path of the Quran and Sunnah. Like what Ibn Qayyim al Jawziz, we mentioned many of his books. In the Miftah al Jannah, in the Keys to Paradise, you find the, the disease and the cure. Like what other many books that he wrote, you know, many famous books of Tazkir. That's what they classified him as Tabib al Qalb. The doctor of the heart is Ibn Qayyim al Jawziya. <laughs> his books, he talked about Tazkir. But once again, if there happens to be words which go against the Quran and Sunnah, then they any are any to be rejected. So irrespective of who the personality is. As for today, what are the current practices? Do any of these 
if we claim that they are Sufis, these individuals, do you ever find amongst them the external practice that exists today of singing, of dancing, of music, of free mixing, and even you find hashish is allowed you know, for them because externally you find even Arabi is evoked as well that wine is water, water is wine, so nothing really happens whichever of these substances that you take. <coughs> they, they thrive on these. And if, you, if, you listen, if you sat down and listen to their words, if you listen to the words of Kufr and dissected them, obviously it sounds sweet, it sounds nice, etc. But if you sat down and you began to decipher the words and began to study the words, you'd find that these words are nothing but Kufr in it and Shirk. And thus we find that these people are moving people away from the Qur'an. The essence, the life of the Muslim is based upon the Qur'an. The text of the Qur'an. For them, they say that you're ignorant if you begin to study the Qur'an. Don't read the Qur'an. Don't study the Qur'an. Don't read the tafsir of the Qur'an. Stay away from the Qur'an. Stay away from Islamic sciences. You don't need to study al-uloom. You don't need to develop the science of hadith, of Qur'an, and fiqh, etc. Just, you need to follow this, this path and that is any sufficient. Like what you find, you want to destroy the right aqidah, the right belief. That is amongst the core elements as we mentioned. Why, why infuse people with such beliefs? Why do we need to infuse people with such beliefs? That Allah subhanahu becomes one with the, uh, with the creation and everything around us is, is Allah, is a reflection of Allah. Is that what the Prophet Muhammad taught his people? Is that what he came to teach the people? So then what is the distinction between Christianity, Judaism and Islam? What is it? Islam, as we mentioned, is the Puritan belief. The Puritan belief of bringing people to worship and single out Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for worship in it all alone. And likewise, you find to follow the Prophet Muhammad is the best way to gain tazkiyah. You read through the Quran and Sunnah, don't you find tazkiyah? Adhkar, ba'da salah, ad-du'a, qiyamul layl, al-hajj, wal-umrah, giving of wealth, lan tanalu birra hatta, yani, tunfiqu mimma tuhibbud. You're never going to attain piety, don't spend with the things that you love any living a simple life, all these etiquettes that we find is all the real spirituality that will give the person that level of spirituality in following the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Likewise, and ibadat, why exercise ourselves? That's when you read through the works, you have to exercise yourself in these rituals and then you come close to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. What greater, to, you know, to use the word ritual, but what greater ibadah can there be than putting your face down on the floor? and submitting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in salah. That's why Ibn Taymiyyah mentioned, if you want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to talk to you, then read the Qur'an. And if you want to talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then stand up in a salah. Wa aqimi salata li dhikri. Establish the prayer for my dhikr. For the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the ibadat that we find, the rituals that laid out by the Prophet Muhammad are ideal rituals. Now they want to come along and say, no, that's not enough. These rituals, we need to find even more better rituals. And that is something which is going in the, against in the, the teachings that were brought down by the Prophet in the, Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So these are just a few words we want to share about the about the belief and the ethics that, that we have. We ask Allah subhanahu wa taala give us all the tawfiq and ability to remain true to the steadfast teachings of the Quran and Sunnah, and to expose those individuals who go away from the, the blessed Quran and the Sunnah to keep us and preserve us and keep us upon the truth until we return back and we meet Allah subhanahu wa taala. Wa qul qawli hada wa astaghfirullahi wa lakum. ولجميع المسلمين والصالحين والغفور الرحيم سبحانك رب حمدك شكرا لا إله إلا أنت استغفرك وأتوب إليك بارك الله فيك. إبدأ أسمع سرتني من form of revelation or form of inspiration came to Umar bin Khattab. So how do you know these things don't happen today? Ulama well, have discussed that even today people may find this intuition or this feeling or some foresight, insight that they have. So in general, people who are close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they don't really mention these points. As for to go around and to mention and to, and to gain some extra blessing, whatever it may be, that's the first thing that we need to understand. So there will be people may be given different forms of, of, of karamat, of, of, of patience, of of strength, of, of mental ability, whatever it may be. And likewise, you may find that certain things are inspired to them. So we're not negating that fact. But there's a path to gain that inspiration. If that path of inspiration is breaking away from the Qur'an and the Sunnah, then that becomes something which is rejected. And we know that Umar al-Khattab, that his inspiration was based upon falling strictly to the Qur'an and the Sunnah was bestowed upon him. But many of these individuals that we find, they are only searching for these karamah. As you find, they, they mentioned, in Taymiyyah, he mentioned by Imam al-Ghazali, a person in it once came to me and said that um, I want wisdom to flow out of my mouth. So uh, Imam Ghazali said to him that uh, then he becomes sincere for 40 days 
and you'll find any wisdom will flow out of your mouth. After 40 days, he came back to Imam Ghazali and said, you told me that after 40 days, if I, if I remain sincere, wisdom will flow out of my mouth. Wisdom doesn't just come out of your mouth for many, quite for 40 days. Imam Ghazali, what they actually would say to him, إِنَّمَا أَخْلَصْتَ يَنِي لِلْحِكْمَةِ You became sincere for wisdom. وَمَا أَخْلَصْتَ لِلَّهِ سُبْحَانَ تَعَالَى You did not become sincere for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So still a fine definition. You were sincere just to gain that wisdom. You wasn't sincere to gain Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or to get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you automatically hikmah. You become yani, yani something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bestow yani, upon the individual. But they are only searching for, if you have some miracle, you know, if I pop out a, you know, a bag of dates now out of my hand or whatever it may be, that shows that I must be a, a wali. You know, a rabbit out of the brother's hat or something. You know, that shows. <laughs> that's, that's the science. That's not, that's not science. As Ahl Sunnah, we don't base that Iman upon seeing these signs. And that's what the masses have become. But as we mentioned, our sign for us is the Quran. That is the everlasting miracle until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lift it. As for anything else, if it's done, the person has it, and the person the most awliya tried to conceal it. There's no need to mention it, but they may have been given, be bestowed upon them. But they want to show that as a point that to prove to people that I am close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but in essence, as we mentioned, to exploit people and whatever they want to really gain from, from the masses, Wallahu a'lam. Can you explain firasa to say that the believer sees through another light other than... Hey, firasa yani means insight. So say for example, any person may be dealing in hadith and basically excessive study of hadith, they have their foresight to be able, just like a money changer today, me and you may not be able to make a distinction, but that person may just look at the note and be able to, to read the note and say this is fake. Likewise, a person who's been studying and working with people may have the foresight that you see a person and you can see this person this type of character maybe in the mashallah yourself age of experience you can see a young boy you can see certain traits and you can say you know he's a good individual when somebody may come to offer the hand in marriage to your daughter or family members so that's possible so there's nothing wrong with that that type of farasa that's something that which is acceptable in islam that a person is given that type of intuition of understanding or skill to be able to recognize any certain things there's nothing wrong with that Allah alam. <coughs> they follow Ibn Arabi and other Sufis claim that only the Sheikhs can understand the statements. They tell us not to read the words because we will misinterpret them, consider them as kufr. What should our answer be to this? Like I said, the, the statements are quite clear. Even their own Sheikhs, their own students, they carry on making that kufr. So then who's supposed to read the works then? So we can't read it, and only they can read it, so they can carry on keeping us in the, in the dark. So the journey continues, isn't it? You can't read it, I can't read it. Only their special shaykhs can read it, and only they can make ta'wil. If they make ta'wil to say, interpretation, that this is something which is incorrect, then our case is closed. But they carry on building upon that kufr by saying such words, you can't understand what they're saying. It's the clear Arabic language. The clear language used, some of these spoke Arabic clearly. And an al haqq now, how can we interpret that? What's the interpretation that we should be given for that? It doesn't mean what you think. That's why they have this, this concept, they have this special word that, that, the word that they use, that this is you need something for you that seems words of kufr, but in the world of the Sufis, it's something different. And this, is, this type of deception is not allowed. Deception in Islam is allowed in a state of warfare, or defending one's faith, or being harmed. As for who's harming you? That you need to be deceptive towards the rest of the Muslims and say, look, you don't really understand these words of Ibn Arabi, or or you know, Ibn al-Farid, or Shay Razi, or Sha'rani, all these words, we don't understand them. So what do we understand them? What are we supposed to do now? So you carry on writing kufr and infiltrating with kufr, let it carry on inside the society, and our job, as we mentioned, is not to make a critique of a specific individual, meaning today, there are many people who sincere. Our job is to highlight that the material that you're using, the material that your belief is based upon, is corrupt. Mm -hmm. Finish. End of story. So they want to take it as an emotional and attack upon them or whatever, whatever it may be. These are their words, these are their beliefs that they hold true to. And they never <coughs> ever discredit Ibn Arabi. They never discredit him. They never discredit any of these individuals. That's what they do. They just try to make ta'weel and try to pretend that those are not their words. As we mentioned, these words are documented inside. They need their own books. Wallah alam. Go ahead, brother. What's ta'weel? Ta'weel. That we, and he's making, and he, you owe with shade to change something like tafsir to, to explain something. So, what happens, for example, if a verse means something, they make that we, they reinterpret the verse that it could mean this. And, and that we is based upon, you need language of the Quran, the Sunnah, the Prophet Muhammad, so they keep on reinterpreting things. So, any reinterpretation that goes against the Quran and Sunnah is to be rejected. So, if a Quran, Quranic ayah could be clear, 
like for example, we mentioned, Fakhla na'ale, take off your two shoes. The context is clear. Musa is going to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling him to take off his two shoes. So now they make that we reinterpreted that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling Musa islam to take off your two shoes means get rid of the, the dunya and start working towards the, the akhirah. <coughs> so this type of ta'weel, is it plausible? How does it fit into this into this ayah? If it, if the ayah was talking about the akhirah, talking about something of such a nature, then Ibn Qayyim al Jawziya mentioned, then it becomes plausible. But here, this is something ba'id, this is something far away. And try to bring it into, the, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about the yeah, tazkiyah of, of the nafs, etc. So that's what we mean by ta'weel, which they are well known for in the performance of action. I was approached by a sister who said that it is obligatory to perform salah but not to learn any Qur'an. Is it enough and of ibadah to learn Qur'an? Any learning of the Qur'an, any khayrukum man ta'allama al-Qur'an or allamahu, best of you is he who learns the Qur'an and teaches it to other individuals. So any studying of the Qur'an is fucked. It is an obligation. And if it's obligatory to pray, then how are you praying? You need to read the Qur'an in your prayer. So you need to learn the Qur'an. You need to pay equal attention in learning the Qur'an, that's why many ulama mentioned that the ilm al-tajweed, any basic elementary tajweed, is fard al-ayn. It's an obligation for every single Muslim to be able to read the Qur'an appropriately. It's an obligation, just like fard al-ayn means just like we pray, we have to fast, we perform hajj, it becomes an obligation. So people should try to uh, perfect the Qur'an to the best of ability and try to learn whatever they can of the Qur'an and likewise remain steadfast and obligatory upon the obligatory prayers as well. Allahu a'lam. Going by that. Any, if we want to expose the sheikhs, I feel that you know, we could stay here all night and, and expose them. You understand? At the end of the day, we have enough experience of being with them on various occasions to expose what their real belief and their corruption is. That's not the intent. Our intent is not here and has never been, inshallah, to expose individuals. We just want to expose the truth. If wants to believe, let them believe. If wants to commit kufr, let them commit kufr. All our task at Ahl Sunnah is to establish the hujjah. And tonight, that's all we intend to do, is not to blaspheme against them, not to upset them, is to highlight what are the evidence of the Qur'an and the Sunnah. And that's it, that's a Muslim. A Muslim is not burdened that every time you debate with whoever it may be, that you have to win the argument. That's another thing we need to understand. You understand the evidences, you understand it, that's it. They may come with various arguments and this and that, we, that's it, finish. We're not going to carry on wasting our time and our life and just keep on need, giving a rebuttal and refuting. It happens to be an opportunity and that's as far as we go and then we just carry on with infusing people with the correct belief of the Qur'an and the Sunnah and inspiring people with, with the real spirituality that the Prophet can use by the use of the Qur'an and the Sunnah and if they come in our way then we discuss with them if not then we just carry on what we have to do Allah <coughs> Go ahead, brother. Uh, yeah. Do we judge by what is apparent? Because sometimes people they say that you cannot judge by what is apparent Decisions. You see, they say that uh, if, a, if a person has a beard, for example, he, it doesn't mean that he's better than a person who doesn't have mm. one. So how do we judge? Do we judge by what's apparent? Or? Any, obviously, we should be very careful. There's a fine line, as, as I'm sure that you probably know better than myself. Never judge a book by its cover. So that is that is partially true. So obviously, we need to give every Muslim the space and, and the time. We shouldn't become judgmental because he has a beard. He must be a good Muslim. You understand? Some people may just keep it out of this, this lazy, or this, you know, they're brought out as a habitual practice, isn't it? Some people have that, don't they? Or it becomes the norm of the people that they do these practices. And so people make a critique, you've got a beard, how can you do that? That's unfair as well. Just because he has a beard, he's still a human being. And likewise, if he doesn't have a beard, he's still a, a human being. He may have 99.9 .9 excellent characteristics. That 0.01%, he doesn't have the beard in his face. Apart from that, he doesn't lie, doesn't steal, doesn't cheat, speaks well, he's humble vigilant of their prayers, doing good deeds. So we try to work with one another, rub off one another. So we can learn from him, from his points, and he can learn from us, and we can encourage one another, create the love of Allah, and the Allah love for the Sunnah of the Prophet. That will bring us towards a good direction. As for us to become straightway judgmental, that he looks like this, she looks like this, this is dangerous. We try to remove that from our hearts, even though sometimes it's good. You know, it entices a person, but at the same time, we should be very, very careful and try to look at any you know, possibly our own defects that maybe externally we look good, <coughs> but internally, as we mentioned, there is, as we began with, the heart is corrupt. 
any our love, our fear, our hope, any our intentions, we have our reliance, that inside our heart has that been refined, our, 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 our sickness, our sadness, our weeping, our joy, is the heart at that level. So we so need to work, as you mentioned, the external and the internal. We you know, help all of our brothers and benefit from, from all of them, inshallah. Some Sufis, uh, they say that the Prophet made it known. Made what, sorry, Made? Made it known. Made it Made it known, okay, yeah. They quote this ayah, you know, Kafja, Kumulahi, Kumulahi, Also, they support that. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam many times he prayed to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala that increase his nu. That's right. And they say, if he wasn't a nu, so how he asked Allah to increase his nu? So what does he meant when he asked Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to increase his nu? Hey, Barakullah. First, we find that this ayah is a big thing. When Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was down, that's right. And uh, you know the, he was buried. Mm. Normally, when we uh, bury the person, we say a dua, which is min uh, hafalaknakum uh, mm. Did Prophet Salaam the Sahaba Karam, uh, when they were buried, Prophet Salaam was not. They they read that, mm. and if they did, what did the man write? Okay, Allah Hey, that we find firstly. Um, about this ayat of Surah Al-Ma'idah when the ulama tafasir that they mention that this, you know, the word nur here you know, yudif or yarja' ila madha goes back to what? the siyaq the context of this ayat is talking about what? the Qur'an so they say that nur goes back to the Qur'an and there's, you know, a tilda a few ulama have mentioned that it goes the nur refers to the Prophet Muhammad the Qur'an mentioned you know, he is sirajan Munira, he is the, the blazing star, the blazing sun, etc. The Quran mentioned that. So what do these ayat, what do they mean? He is any Bashir, Wanadir, he is the warner giving glad tidings. So what's the context that we should Ahl Sunnah take it? The context is quite clear. That he is preaching in the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and people are attracted towards what he says. Also to believe that physically that he is nur, that he is nur from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or that he has no shadow. Firstly, these ahadith about having no shadow, they are da'if or they are mawdu'a, they are fabricated. Secondly, even we established that the Prophet Muhammad had no shade. What does that mean? If he's walking, he had no shade. What does that do for us for Ahl Sunnah today? <laughs> what does that really mean? That the Prophet had no shade. Do you understand the point? What does it really mean that he had no shade? What are you trying to prove by that he had no shade? Well, they're trying to prove, as you mentioned the hadith by Adam salam, that the Prophet Muhammad is a rank, supernatural rank. And to take him to a higher level, when he is saying that don't commit khulu, don't extol me, don't praise me like the people done to Isa ibn Maryam. And they even use this mandiq. They even say to us logically, look, the Christians, they praise Jesus. We need to praise the Prophet Muhammad more than Jesus. <laughs> we need to praise him more than Jesus to let the Christians know and let the Muslim Ummah know that we love the Prophet Muhammad. As for the funeral of the Prophet Muhammad, no companion any, could lead the Prophet Muhammad in the funeral prayer. That's why each companion came and done his own yani, his own dua and went. As for to say that the Prophet Muhammad is equal to the awliya, that this is where we say this is blasphemy. That Prophet Muhammad is special. He is unique. You send salah upon him, it goes to him. The angels deliver it to him. Goes back into his soul. That's what we believe. As for them, what they believe, that he becomes hadir and nadir, and he becomes present in our gathering. So he's, he could come to, as we find shortly, yani, Eid Milad the Nabi, Prophet will be coming uh, here in Manchester, coming in, in, in Bradford, coming in Birmingham, coming in Sudan, coming everywhere. So how is he coming everywhere in every single location? Does he find that one of the sheikhs, you know, he highlighted in a famous you know, lecture I've heard in my own ears, he said that the Prophet Muhammad came to him in a dream and said to him, Sheikh, that as long as I'm staying in, in Pakistan, you have to take care of me. <laughs> yeah, this is recorded. Okay. He said that as long as I stay in Pakistan, you have to take care of me, you have to look after me. When the Quran says what? Subhanallah the Asra bi Abdi Layna min al Masjid al Haram al Masjid al Aqsa. Allah took you from Masjid al Haram to Masjid al Aqsa. You have to sort out my plane ticket, PIA. Anyone who wants to fly in PIA anyway. <laughs> my plane ticket back to, to Medina. <laughs> yeah? Back in the tape. Clearly he mentions it. Then he had to release, you know, this is the, the devil playing with the mind. He had to release another tape that you can't understand my dreams. Of course you can't understand your dreams. 
Hey, first we find that, and when when people make a statement in general, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is everywhere. Some people are ignorant, and some and some people are also sincere. If you explain to them what you mean by Allah is everywhere, more an average person will say, I don't believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is everywhere. I believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hears and sees everything that we're doing. So we just correct them and try and <coughs> avoid saying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fi kulli maka. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is everywhere. But then those individuals who have this in the aqeedah, whether it be the maturidi aqeedah or the ash'ari aqeedah, you find that begins to stem away from the belief of Ahl sunnah For their belief is that when you say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Quran says it, Ar-Rahmanu ala al-Arshi stawa, numerous places are the Quran. Ilayhi yas'adu kalimu tayyib, to him Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes there. The good word, all these ayat inside the Qur'an show that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as for in the cave of stawa, how did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ascend the throne, how did it take place, it's majhul, it's unknown. The cave is not known to us. We just take the word Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, istawa ala al-arsh, finish, that's it. So I like what even the Qur'an mentions, وَهُوَ مَعَكُمْ أَيْنَ مَا كُنْتُمْ وَاللَّهُ بِمَا تَعْبَلُونَ بَصِيرُ وَهُوَ مَعَكُمْ أَيْنَ مَا كُنْتُمْ He's with you wherever you are. But they mentioned, Wallahu bima ta'amaluna basir. Allah is watching over everything that you do. So when they make these ta'wilah, they're trying to say, they try to negate Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the position of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is all the concept of, of mantik, of logic inside their books. That Allah is not in the creation, not outside the creation, not in the planet, not outside the planet. So, etc. All this begins to take place. All you kharibul aqal, you need, takes away the mind. Aqid al ahl sunnah is simple. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that He is above His throne. That's it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descends every last part of the night كَمَا يُلِيقُ بِجَلَالِهِ That which befits the majesty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala As for kayf, as for how and when That's not for Ahlul Sunnah to enter And these are all affairs of the unseen We stop there They are the ones that are making ta'wilas They are the ones that begin to make these reinterpretations That's what you find that you write about uh, in, uh, Ibn Batuta, the famous traveller He entered into Dimashq, into Syria <coughs> He said that I saw Ibn Taymiyyah, that's what he loved to say, you, know, you, 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 you Wahhabis, etc. like to use these words, derogatory words, you know. They say Ibn Taymiyyah, a great Wahhabi, that's what you find in, 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 in Sham, they used to burn his books, have great disgust towards him. He said that when he was in the mimbar, he's giving the khutbah, he said that this is how Allah subhanahu wa descends on the throne, and he got down from the mimbar. That's what you know, Ibn Batuta wrote inside his works. So they tried to come and present this to Ahl Sunnah. They look, Ibn Taymiyyah even mentioned this. You go back and you analyze it. Firstly, Ibn Battuta never ever met Ibn Taymiyyah. And when Ibn Battuta entered into Syria, Ibn Taymiyyah was where? In prison. So Allah SWT exposes them. So they tried to make these khurafat, these ta'wilat, make these lies, these false claims. And said, this is you know, what the creed you know, of Ahl Sunnah is, etc. This is how you know, you've gone deviant. And like I said, they spend most of the time trying to do this. You can even just spend you know, maybe half a day, go through the evidences and refute them. You know, so spend your time doing something else. It's not a big thing. You'll have the same old arguments coming again and again trying to present it. And by the way, you say they leave it that. If you want to, just like I said, spend half a day. And that's it. They can spend half of their life trying to prove their points. They won't be able to prove it, inshallah. Go ahead, brother. Yes. Singing and dancing are uh, permissible in the, you know in a, in a wedding using a duff and the segregation on the And if singing, firstly, singing and dancing is not for a man. As what Ulama Fuqa mentioned, that a man who sings and he dances questioned his manhood. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what we find today, boy bands and singing and this, that and the other, the anashi that was done by Muslims at that time was where? In jihad, digging the trench. La Aish illa Aish al Akhir. I'm not going to the studio and doing footsteps and wearing PLO scarves and thinking and liberate Palestine, this, that, and the other. No. It just happens to be we could be in the masjid and just, you know, just, just say something lightheartedly amongst men, amongst our own souls. Yeah, it's Mafi Haraj. Likewise, if it happens to a wedding and only women, 
Yeah, it's segregated. There's no one there, and they play the duck. It's for women. This is for the women. Let them leave them alone, isn't it? Leave them alone to enjoy themselves. They like these things. So how can a man say I like I like these things? <laughs> so leave the women. They are they are totally segregated, and they're doing these actions. Then let them be. <coughs> Provided there's no music, there's no fear or fitna, etc. And you know, just allowed. But as for us men, we don't need to really enter into such any in, 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 in such practices and think this is a form of. Uh, alleviation or contentment in of the heart of Allah. Go ahead, yes. uh, What is mujaddid and uh, what is the criteria for mujaddid? Hey, mujaddid, you find that in certain ahadith, the end of each yani, year, there will come a mujaddid who will revive yani, this ummah. So here, ulama mentioned that al mujaddid will be one who gives a great service to Islam, whether it be in the science of hadith or tafsir or, give, or giving da'wah. As for them, you know what their mujaddid means, yes. isn't it? Coming and making, you know a new recipe of biryani or halwa <laughs> read some of their books that you, uh, that you, uh, you find you find it mentions are their books that on my on my grave and you find one of them he wrote and make sure you bring and eat biryani cook like this and you bring roast chicken and you bring lebu and you bring matai and you bring this on my grave you're a dead man why do you want these things in your grave for who does that food go to and that's you find that one of the sheds that he you know a, like i said we all know they love food mashallah don't be all eh? so you find that um, one of the sheds that the uh, the Marid went to wake him up in the morning and um, so the Sheikh got angry and said, why are you waking me up in the morning? <coughs> the Sheikh, it's time for Fajr in the morning. He said, don't ever disturb me again. I was praying my Fajr in Medina. <laughs> <laughs> I was busy praying my Fajr in Medina. You came and you disturbed me. And I have to offer my, my prayer here. So when the Marid told his, his wife this, that, you know, this is my Sheikh, look at mashallah, he's really praying in, in Medina, mashallah, every day in the morning. So the wife said, okay, she's very intelligent. She said, call your Sheikh for dinner. Let's call your Sheikh for dinner. Give him some good dinner, you mashallah, good Sheikh, and you're a good Marine. She cooked dinner for you know, all of them and, you know, brought the food out. So the Sheikh, is looking at everyone's plate, you know, breast piece, chicken piece, thigh piece, look at mashallah. He's saying to his people, look at my Marine. Look at his family, may Allah bless them, how much khidmah they do, all his food, all his preparation. Then comes his food. So he's already dying hungry, waiting for his food. <laughs> so his food comes with a covering on top of it. So he goes, MashaAllah, SubhanAllah, look at my marid. Look at the food, look at the preparation, <laughs> even hidden, covering up this presentation. So the food comes in front of him, he removes the cloth and he only sees rice there. Because what's this? What kind of respect is everyone got a chicken piece, a leg piece, this piece? You give me plain rice? Why well, pops her head out from the, wind, uh, from the kitchen and says, Listen, Chef, in the morning you was praying Fajr inside Medina, just move the rice, can't you see the chickens underneath there? There's no more questions, but we'll take one or two more questions. Right about that. Yeah, I'd just like to say that I've just said it in a Cool. Well, I just want to know, you know, like, uh, like, uh, you know, you have people who are so destructive, you know, like, magic. That's right. I just right. want to know what's omen mean. Omen. Omen, yeah. Yeah, you find that omen, you need, is like you find a, a good luck, you need that, that could happen. Uh, that sometimes there's some uh, good luck that being allowed. You know, maybe good luck could be the saying of certain words or blessing the, the, the individual. As for bad omens that we find, you know, that people may believe in, you know, like a black cat going coming in front of you or the spilling of salt or walking underneath an, a ladder or an umbrella. In these type of omens, you need to stay you need away from them, inshallah. Right, one more, brother David, inshallah. Why do most Sufis refer to Abdul Qadir Jilani? Mm -hmm. Abdul Qadir Jilani, Abdul Qadir Jilani. You find that Abdul, Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jilani, you read his books and nothing but Tawheed. But because obviously he became a great reviver, likewise many of these ulama, they find all famous ulama. So people begin to make a business out of their, their, their works and the things that they've done and the journeys that they made. So they begin to exploit them. So thus they begin to give certain titles and they begin to invent certain any, any false any, uh, stories as well. So Abdul Qadir Jilan, you may have seen that famous photo of man in green clothing on the end of a boat. And you find that the baby is coming out of the ocean because one day the baby fell inside there and he said to the ocean, bring out the, the baby and the baby came out. You know, wallah alam, obviously we know that this is nothing but incorrect. But Shaykh Abdul Qadir Jilan, he was a great Shaykh. Mm -hmm. If you read his books of Tawheed, in his writing, you'll, you'll be very surprised. But obviously, as, as we said, they try to extract what they want to do and try to you know, pretend that these people are great saints, etc. Like what many of the graves and shrines even today, they were famous uh, scholars. They were famous individuals who traveled and because they traveled, left their land, exerted their efforts. So these people, they like to come along and try to exploit that and say, you know, 
as Ahlu Sunnah visiting the graves is not allowed. In this manner that people have this ritual, habitual practice, you know, I've been to graves and I've heard people asking the person, the dead person in the grave. Asking the dead person in the grave, what is that? That's clear shit. And that's what a masses of we, we say that why are our countries in a bad state? That's the reality. In our country, every hundred yards, you have to do what? Chuck a rupee, isn't it? To get by the grave for safety. And some of the graves are what? Some of the graves, is one <coughs> grave you find, a man who's traveling, and his friend died. And he began to cry. The people come together and they said, you need, uh, why are you crying? He said, you know, my friend used to help me on my journey, take my luggage, used to be a good traveler, we used to be sharing time together. People began crying as well. <laughs> people began crying on that, on that grave that, was, that he made, and then he went off. So he went off somewhere, he came back the following year, he went past that same grave, he saw a great big mausoleum, and he went by, then he asked the people, um, who is this grave for? Regarding I said, don't you know this man, he used to help so many people carry their luggage, take them here, take care of them. <laughs> he goes, you, you fools, you donkeys, that's my donkey that died there. <laughs> <laughs> 70, have you ever seen a 70 foot grave? Can you imagine a 70 foot grave? 70 foot grave in Multan. So that's what people, we, we don't deny the essence of the, of the people, the good people, that's not what we're denying. We are denying the exploitation that's taking place at the moment, is what we are rejecting. Even today, Lahore, you know what they watch, wash the grave with every year? With milk. Hindu rituals. You go inside there today, go inside there today. If it throw a bird, if a bird goes to the right, it's good luck, goes to the left, it's bad luck. <laughs> <laughs> that's all, like I said, if I want to go, go expose it, one day I feel like going back and, and recording everything and showing people this is what they believe, so this is what they believe in. I had times to involved with, with individuals that were very close involved with them in this movement. And they used to narrate to me everything. Narrate what was going on. I used to say to them, you're going to be the peer when you come back here. Yeah, look at the state. You don't even get up for fudge listening to Bollywood all night long. Oh, chef, don't worry about it. Because those saints are finished. Some of them coming out in the morning in a state of intoxication, blowing on the bread and just giving it to the people. It's all controlled. That spirituality, most of them is finished now. So that real level of spirituality. And as you mentioned, if it goes against the Sharia, then whatever the names may be. Take, take this final question, Shada. Brother, uh, to, hey, go ahead, brother. The terminology is used now mm. is called commercialized. This is, is everything is commercialized. That's right. Religion has become commercialized, right. just like the world, everything mm. else is. That's right. Unfortunately, there's two sides to it now. Mm. The true people who are mm. true, the minority, mm. then the majority who are commercialized That's as right. being to, you know, make money. That's what it is. Mm. That's right, okay, we all know that. I'm sure that many of us can tell the person stories of what these people exploit to be. Why are you going to give me 10,000 pounds and get you a place in paradise? Open statements in the must have been given. Open statements, give me 10,000 pounds, I'll get you a place in paradise. <laughs> Audacity to say that? No. Any, look, we're all intelligent individuals. In our work, in our career, we weigh up everything, don't we? But when it comes to Islam, you need some mumbuk mumbaunga yakkeloon. Deaf, dumb, and blind, in fact, that we become whatever the Sheikh says. He said it finished. I know people that be that they a, a warrant has been placed on their head. A, a, a deaf tab has been put on their head. That the Sheikh has said, we want him dead. And in one country, a person went out and they killed him. And when he was arrested by the police, and the police said to him, don't you know it's haram to kill another Muslim? Of course it's haram to kill another Muslim. So why do you kill him then? Because my Sheikh said, if I kill him, I go to paradise. So I killed him, and I'll take any punishment you give me today. So we, we debate them with evidences, but obviously they become emotional, then they begin to place tags on people's heads, because why? Their business, their empire is at stake. We're not here to take anyone's business and anybody's empire. We're here that you worship who? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Finish. End of story. That's what the role of a Muslim is, wherever they go, to tell people to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what exploitation, and we're all fully aware of the exploitation that begins to take place. I tell you, final question. I was told that someone heard you on YouTube saying that plucking eyebrows is okay. That's totally incorrect. I've never ever said that in my life. Rather, it must be the opposite. The verses I saw to the Hashim, the 59th chapter of Quran, verse number 7. Whatever the messenger tells you to take, take it. Whatever it tells you to take, uh, abstain from, abstain from it. Read the tafsir of Ibn Kathir, and then you find clearly, so to the Hashim, the 59th chapter, verse number 7. A woman by the name of Umm Yaqub came to Abdullah bin Mas'ud and said that you have cursed, any those women who pluck their eyebrows and place gaps inside their teeth and tattoo their bodies, you have cursed them. He said, go and read the book of Allah, you'll find it inside there. 
She said, I read the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I cannot find it. He said, if you read this verse, indeed you will find it. Whatever the messenger tells you to take, take it. Whatever it tells you to abstain from, abstain from it. She said, indeed I find your family doing it. He said, go and see if my family does it. If my family do it, then I will divorce my family. She went, came back and said, indeed your family, and he doesn't do this action. So I've never ever said it is allowed for a person to pluck their eyebrows. The only thing that problem I've allowed that maybe if a person is suffering inside their marriage, it may be something that that becomes something very, very, very specific. As for some, in general, it is not allowed for a woman you need to pluck your knee and eyebrows. They finally, we know that, mashallah, brothers have invited us previously before on this occasion uh, as well. You can see the mashallah, mashallah, and, and that one is worth his doing. So they've encouraged <coughs> all of us to contribute towards the running and the welfare uh, of this masjid and inshallah, I don't know if there's a, a bucket or standing yeah, orders or something that we're going through. Contribute this to your local masjid to help you spread the da'wah, inshallah. وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا مِمَّنْ دَعَى إِلَى اللَّهِ وَعَمِلَ الصَّالِحَةً فَقَالَ إِنَّنِي مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ Who is the best one who believes in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and does righteous actions. And that is then the call of what all of us Muslims should be. Like I said, our words we mentioned tonight, we should not take them and go and exploit these individuals and try to harm them. We should try to be sincere in our lives, we should try to advise them that your, what you believe in and what your actions are incorrect. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strengthen the, the imams, the, the people inside the masjid, the various imams that we have, and the brothers, and the contribution, and the efforts in putting the, 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 these, uh, these good works together that all of us may benefit and prosper from these blessings inside this dunya. Inside the Akhirah, I call the Kohihada, I'll start for the Muslim, 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 I'll start for the Mu